Thank you. Um, first of all, where are my content managers at? My people. Some in the audience, some may be um, in their various other parts of the DMO. So I was asked to give case studies of the world's best destination marketers and the world's best content marketers. Nobody told me they had to be people. So you're probably wondering what these are. These are what are called bowers. They are thrones for female bower birds to sit in. And they are carefully constructed by bower birds in Northern Australia and in New Guinea. And what the bower birds do, the male ones, they pick up shells, plastics, they highly decorate these homes, these thrones, these cathedrals, and then they bring in the female and berry in mouth, give them the dance. Just like that. This is content marketing. It is the story before the sales message. That bird was a tourist. They lured it in. They gave it what they hoped that it liked. We see content marketing way back. In fact, 6,000 years ago, people were already doing content marketing. This is from a cave painting that is loosely translated as, six ways spear can save you from death from wild boar. <laughs> so for as much as BuzzFeed thinks that it revolutionized content, lists happened way before BuzzFeed did. Now, we look at content in two different ways. How do we attack it? Strategy and tactics. This presentation will go over strategy first, and then we're gonna get down into the major content nerding part of it, the tactic, tactics of it. Sun Tzu, I swear, like revolutionized communication because he was t talking in tweets before Twitter even happened. <laughs> like every profound thing he says is 140 characters or less. <laughs> and it's actually a technique that was passed on when President Obama did his inauguration address. If you look back at that speech, there were words in it and sentences in it that they specifically tailored to be less than 140 characters, just so that it could be shown across Twitter. That's content marketing. That is the little minute details that can help you spread your message and help you promote your destination. So strategy-wise, what is our strategy as content marketers, and in my case, for destinations all across the world, in your case, for the destination which you're representing today? Stories will always, 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 always be at the core. If content marketing is this beautiful tapestry it is, if your destination is this beautiful tapestry, it's the tiny little threads of stories that create it. And we always want to be delivering high quality, engaging, emotive, valuable stories. If we do those, not only create them, but identify them and share them, that the stories that other people are creating, and we put them to the right channels, to the correct audience, in which it resonates, that's when we make an impact in content marketing. So what makes good content? I get this question all of the time. And I always joke with my coworkers, I had a project where I had to write 20 blogs in five days for a destination. It was a very compressed um, timeline for a project. And I would always joke, I'm going into the content cave. Have anybody ever been there, like where you just don't want to talk to anyone, and you're like heads down? So when you go into the content cave, what type of content are you looking to create? What type of content resonates with an audience? What type of content gets shared across multiple platforms? First of all, your content has to be a story and it has to connect. And stories have to be tailored to the individuals who read them. What makes a good story? Somebody reads it, they say, this resonates to my life. This is written for me. You can't write for everyone anymore. You have to write to the individuals who visit your destination. Attention. We'll get way into this in tactics. Attention is also often the most overlooked part of all content management. You may write the greatest blog of all time, but if you pick the wrong photo for the Facebook thumbnail, no one will ever see it. It will get buried. You have to capture people's attention. And as professional content marketers, you have those skills, you have that knowledge 
of how to grab their attention. Value. Dan touched on this so well in the last presentation. Does your content deliver value to someone? And value can be in a lot of different ways. If they share it on their Facebook wall, having already been to this destination, does it give them the cultural capital? Does it make them look cooler for having been there? Does value give them information about your destination that they might not have already known? Does it tell them about a place in which their interest in barbecue can be delivered by a specific barbecue restaurant, a specific style of barbecue down a hidden alley? That's delivering value that they might not already have had. And then simply also value can be, and we see this in social media a lot, the things that get shared are the ones that truly offer monetary value. Is it a special deal? Does it a cheap airline fare suddenly to your destination? Um, is it a special uh, discount code for an upcoming festival? That type of value can resonate as well. We're telling stories. Stories have to have emotion. Emotion can be a variety of different things. Amazement, emotion. Happiness, sadness that they're not there. Longingness, remembrance. It has to convey emotion. Going back to connection. Something for everyone is nothing for anyone. If there's a, a theme of this conference, I think that's it. A-B testing is the exact example of that. You're trying to find what resonates with each individual that logs onto your web page, or your Facebook page, or your Instagram account. If you try and be something for everyone, no one is going to connect with your content. So now some interactive portions. Does anybody know what this beautiful city is? Questions, guesses? Chicago. Any others? William, what'd you guess the other day? Brisbane. Brisbane. It's some city I can't pronounce in Siberia. It's actually in Russia, in Siberia, Yekinatuburg. And the reason I bring this slide up is because every city is by a river. That's a, an example of proper city building. You want to build your city by a river. Every city has broadways. Every city is walkable. And we go back to tourism marketing in the 80s and 90s, and so much of what's posted in those brochures and those websites, and the, well, websites weren't around the 80s, but further as we go into the 90s, is this idea of this beautiful, sunny city by a river. And we're allergic to that now. Every city has this. What is it about your destination that makes it unique? What is it that brings someone to it? What is it that connects? What is it that adds value, that grabs their attention? So when we think about creating these stories as a destination and creating content for them, I always want to ask this one question, and this is what every content manager can do when they think about their city, is ask, what would planet Earth miss if my destination fell off of the map? Think in your head, what would planet Earth miss if your destination fell off the map? Most likely, it's not because it's a city by a river. Most likely, it's not because it's walkable. But is it those individual stories? Is it that taste of the barbecue? Is it the fact that you can walk in or down a boulevard on a Tuesday at 12 o'clock and hear live music? And we go into what every city's main or town's main selling point is and what their story is, and most of them are unique. Don't sell yourself short by trying to be something for everyone. So when we look at case studies around the world, and we have our hands on so many different social media profiles, we look at Melbourne. Melbourne is this gorgeous city right by a river. The temptation would be to say, we're the sunny, beautiful Australian city that's modern. The truth is there's like eight of those um, that are close to Melbourne size. When we're managing Melbourne's page and we're posting content, the content that resonates is the ones, are the ones that take it down to the street level. And this is one of the most popular photos ever posted on that page. I actually found it going to imager.com, which if you ever want to find out what people are saying about your destination, the two top places you can look, Reddit, and search your destination, imager to find the photos and the videos that people are most interested in, and then also the trip advisors. And found this image on Imager, 
which sorts photos based on relevancy, which sorts photos based on how people are interacting with them about your destination, or in this case, Melbourne. And this was the very number one. It's rainy. It's a morning. It captures the attention as a content managing nerd. It's got a vanishing point, which is always attractive. It has reflecting water, which people are attracted to on social media. It's got an interesting color to it. But the story of this photo right here is what people are saying about it. Because this photo is of the main transit station where almost every visitor goes when they visit Melbourne. And look, some people are talking about waking up in the hotel that's near it. Or they're discussing the architecture. Or they're talking about the busker playing on the steps outside opposite of the cathedral. There are so many tiny woven stories into the main appeal of the destination. But you have to take it to the street level to present them. So we look at a city like Cleveland, which William discussed. And what they're doing is they're saying they're another city on a river. And they paired two bloggers. One was from Cleveland, an advocate of the destination. And the other was a beauty pageant queen who had recently come out as a lesbian and paired them together for the LGBT market. Finding those niches. They were hosting the gay games over the summer and they brought them in for that. Finding and connecting those niches, telling the stories of potential people in this niche of why they would want to come to Cleveland, not just being that city by a river. Which leads me to a city where the rivers are frozen. Um, has anybody, if anybody can name this city or town, this is Anuvik, Canada. And if anybody has ever heard of Anuvik, Canada, anybody? Anuvik, Canada? Ben, Ben's been there. Uh, been from our office, and it was cold, I'm sure. Anuvik, Canada is right there. <clears throat> it's the highest town in North America. You want to see how cold Anuvik is? So this. One more time. So what's crazy about this video is that it's actually not Anuvik. That's a town that's 700 miles south of Anuvik. That's roughly the distance from here to South Dakota. So that's how cold Anuvik is. They asked us, what can we do on social media to promote our destination? And we said, well, let's get started. And we took a look at their audience. And this is the best audience on Facebook that we could have hoped for. 1,700 people, obviously we'd want more. But they were composed mostly of Anuvik residents, which was like half the town. It's a town of 3,000. And then outside followers who were in close destinations to Anuvik, more Arctic destinations, maybe a little farther south in their provinces. And what we did is we said, they are going to tell our stories. And they also are going to have to populate our stories. We didn't have any photos. We had no videos when we started. But we kept true to the strategy of taking those residents' photos, taking visitor photos, putting them to the right channels, giving them to a qualified audience, and that it would take off from there. So first, we had to find all of this content. As content managers, this is probably what a lot of your day looks like, of like, where am I going to get that photo? Where am I going to get that video? This is an Arctic fox, which is actually in Anuvik. So what we did is we started looking everywhere. And in fact, there were photos and videos and stories about Anuvik that were being told before we even started posting on their page. So where did we look? We went, obviously, to Google. We went to Hootsuite, where we set up a column in which we geotargeted the center of Anuvik, and we looked at every tweet that had ever emanated from their town in a 50-mile radius over the last three years. And we went straight down that stream, and I read every single tweet. We went to GramFeed, which is a lot like um, Stackla or um, 
another, any Instagram search tool um, or tool that will allow you to find photos geographically tagged. And we went to that town center, we selected it on the map, and then we looked at a radius of all the photos that were uploaded within that town center. We searched, we actually like brought Google blog search back from the dead through an interesting trick. And we found blogs that had written, been written about Anuvik. We went to Imager and we looked at every photo that had been posted of Anuvik. We actually contacted the town's mayor who we heard had a DSLR camera. And we asked for his hard drive. And he sent us photos. Pinterest was one of the best places that we can find stories. It was aggregating the stories about Anuvik for us. So when we typed in Anuvik into Pinterest, the best ones were at the top. So what we thought was, we have all these stories, we have small channels, now how do we get them out to the world? The Arctic has an extremely high internet rate. The pretty obvious reason is that people aren't going outside when it's 50 degrees below zero. In fact, they're on their computers very often. And the townspeople have a high internet consumption rate. So we thought, if we take all of these stories and we find them and we ask for them and we curate them and we present them in a connecting, attention-grabbing, value-adding, and emotive way, we can get them to share them. And William Slide said it best this morning, in the 1980s, the number one motivation for travel and influence in travel was friends and family. In 2016, it is still that way. So why not take the town's residents all 1,200 of them on our Facebook page, and have them share our stories on a daily basis. Anuvik also didn't have a newspaper, so we effectively became that newspaper. And on a daily basis, we posted about everything possible that a newspaper would cover. Sports. There was a man that was running down their frozen Arctic roads every single day and posting about it, and we wrote about that. They had the world's most northern stoplight, so we gave traffic updates. <laughs> we gave movie reviews. Star Wars had just come out. We did cartoons. They have a reindeer herd, and we photoshopped Simba on, um, and they shared that because they thought it was funny. We also gave obituaries. If you look at the date here, December 5th, the sun is setting. Goodbye, sun. We'll see you next year. So. Do the math there. The sun didn't come up for 42 days. The town actually operates in total darkness from basically the beginning of December through the middle of January. There's a cool flyover. We asked the Canadian Air Force for a photo of it, posting news constantly about the destination. Weather, Anuvik had a heat wave. <laughs> this is Celsius, by the way. Uh, so don't think that, that Washington, D.C. was actually negative 8. It's Celsius. Um, so Anuvik had a heat wave. And then just classic good quality photos, as much as we could find, as often as we could find, on a daily basis. So when it came time that we asked the favor of sharing the content, they were already doing it with those posts, but we directly asked them. Because we knew that we had delivered value, we knew that we had captured people's attention, and the emotion of, this is my town. I am proud of this town. I'm going to share it with my friends and family, with people that I've met that are in destinations all across of Canada. 10% of the town shared this photo, um, which would be amazing if you could get 10% of your entire population to share a photo. So basically, what we did was we turned the town's residents into our own paper boys. And they pedaled across the digital landscape of Canada throwing out the newspaper and connecting with people that they already knew and putting it in their mailbox. Page of 1,600 people became 3,600. 45,000 stories created, 6 million impressions. The power of just a concentrated core of storytellers connecting on the right platform can do wonders. It has totally leveled the landscape of digital marketing and that you can compete even with the smallest of audiences if they tell the most compelling stories. And what one did is they shared it on their Facebook wall and they happened to be friends with the editor of BuzzFeed Canada. And BuzzFeed Canada wrote a story on 
Anuvik basically introducing this to the endless sun part, which happens in the summer when the sun doesn't go down for 40 days. There's actually interesting pictures of kids playing hockey at 3 a.m. on the streets. Within a day, this was picked up by AOL News. The next day, it was on the front page of ABC News in America. The day after, it was on Good Morning America. So we had a core audience of 3,200 people, and suddenly we were reaching millions of viewers on an American television show in the very morning. It took three days for that cycle. It's wild how social media marketing also usually mimics that of a virus, and that it starts with a small qualified audience, and it builds there, and then once it spreads, it goes viral. In Anuvik's case, all of this exposure went from 2012, where tourism was maybe not something they wanted to invest in, into an industry in which they were getting visitation at the very tip of North America from six different continents. What we did is we delivered Anuvik not to an audience of everyone. We delivered it to the most qualified audience that we could. And the people that visited aren't the ones that want everything in a town. They're not the ones that think a town is going to have the best food, the best place for family, the best biking pass. We delivered a Nuvik and we connected with people because they were looking for that edge of the world, that feeling of total isolation, that feeling of extreme Arctic, of wild adventure. And we didn't convince people that they needed we didn't convince people that they needed a Nuvik. They had already convinced themselves. They've already made that decision that this is what they need. So when you think about your messaging in content marketing, assume that people already have decided what they want. And it's up to you to convince them because you know your destination the best. It's up to you to convince them that you have what they are looking for. So that is our overall strategy in which stories will always be at the core. And we look back at Peyton Manning's career, he is the best example of this two-pronged approach of strategy and tactics. When you think about Peyton Manning in a 400-yard passing game, you have to look back the week before where he's looking at the defenses, he's having meetings with his coaches, all the way up to the point where he walks up to the line of scrimmage and does who knows what to position his players when he thinks what well, if the defense is in cover two. That is the strategy portion. But what makes him elite is when he combines that with the tactics, the footwork, the arm power, the vision that he has, the touch on the football. And that's what the role of a content manager is, to take those strategies and implement tactics. The Tour de France actually started as content marketing. In the early 1900s, there was a newspaper called La Auto, which became La Keep, which is actually still around today. And it was the summer, and they're like, we don't have anything to write about. Let's create the most extreme bike race that goes across our country. We'll make it really long and really hard so that we'll have content for like 30 days. So they created the Tour de France. And the actual yellow jersey, the iconic symbol of the Tour de France, is the yellow tint of the paper when it was distributed in the early 1900s. And the reason I bring this up is because there's 96 jerseys on this photo. And of these 96, not a single one had been won by a British cyclist, which is preposterous to think about that Britain, this powerful modern country, couldn't have a Tour de France winner in 96 years. And there was all these theories like, did they not have the, the strong hearts of Spanish riders who grew up in the Basque country and were riding mountains in the Pyrenees from the day that they grew up? Or the grit of Italian riders who grew up in really poor areas of Italy and had found success just out of their sheer determination. There was no real answer of why British riders could not win the Tour de France. And they changed their approach here in the 2000s when they hired this man. He was a semi-amateur cyclist in his 20s. He was an MBA. He studied sports psychology in school. And his name was Dave Brailsford. And he came up with the idea of marginal gains. And as a content manager, this always speaks to me. 
is how can we get that 1% in everything we do, whether it's posting a photo and making it 1% optimized, optimizing that headline just the slightest bit, posting it at the perfect time. And he did this in cycling. He looked at every aspect of an operation in cycling. And he looked at the Tour de France. He said it's 2,000 miles. They bike for 86 hours. And the winner usually wins by two minutes, which is way less than 1%. So what marginal gains did he install? Crazy stuff. Custom bedding and pillows. Sleep is the most important thing for a cyclist. They'd carry these huge custom beddings into hotels. And when they would go from stage to stage across the country in their training and in their races, they would install custom bedding and pillows in every single bed that their rider slept in. So you'd have the same pillow that you slept in last night. Hand washing, they brought in a surgeon and said cyclists are always sick. If they lose three days of training, that's 1% of the year, let's teach them how to wash their hands properly. Simple things, changing the hotel air filters. They're, drink, they're breathing in better air. Cyclists get massages often. They optimize the massage oil. They were afraid that dust was accumulating on the pieces of their bike, so to see how dirty their bike mechanic shop was, they painted the floor white. Bike seats. A more comfortable rider is more likely to train more often because they like their seat. Flavored water. Hydration is one of the most important things for a cyclist. To make somebody drink more, flavor their water. Every little thing. No shaking hands to get sick. Um, when they cross the finish line, instead of going like this, he wants them punching their bike computer so they get the exact, exact reading of when they cross the finish line and they can analyze that data as opposed to the slowdown 20 yards later because they're still celebrating. Training at the exact time of the race. It goes on and on and on and on. He finds these 1% in everything they do. And the idea is if you do 1% better in everything you do, and especially in content, over time, that will go from this little bit of advantage into this massive gap. And people said he was totally crazy, like this will never work. Within two years, a British man named Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France. That summer, they won more gold medals in cycling than any other nation. Two years later, Chris Froome, another Brit, won the Tour de France. He's set to repeat again this year. He won again. He could be a three-time winner. So Britain, in five years of marginal gains, totally changed the cycling landscape. So you're probably wondering, how in the world does this apply to content marketing? Content marketing is just like the Tour de France. It is one of the most competitive things that you can do. And right now, the news feed is the new battleground of content marketing. You are competing for the nine seconds of attention that you are hoping that you might get from somebody when they log on. You're competing for clicks, shares, time, attention. We're all competing for $7.2 trillion in tourism spending that will happen next year. And this battle goes on in every single Facebook news feed. It goes on in every single Twitter timeline and every single Instagram feed, Pinterest board, and so on. So when somebody logs on, to Facebook, they are eligible to see about 50 posts from a page on a daily basis and about 1,500 posts from their friends on Facebook. To put this in perspective, the average news feed of a social media user is more competitive than Times Square. So how do we get the attention of those people? How do we get them talking about our destination? What happens is destinations often don't optimize their content. And if they're talking about something that doesn't resonate with an audience, it doesn't grab their attention, it's the equivalent of walking into Times Square, going to the bathroom, and writing visit my city on the bathroom wall. It just will not be seen if we are not optimizing our content. So when we go into tactics, these are some opportunities that we can implement today, tomorrow, and so on, looking for that 1% that can make that difference when we impart our strategy. So our front row, can anybody find the dot? You have nine seconds. Show of hands, quick. We got one, two, so it took a while. How about now? 
a little faster. So we got two pretty fast. Probably because most people read images in an F-shaped formation. This is also how people read your blogs. They read the headline, which is the most important part. Then they read the first sentence of the first paragraph, which is the second most important part. And then maybe a couple sentences below that, and then they'll zip right down. So how are you structuring your blog? The headline is the most important. What words are you using in that headline? What are you using in that headline to grab people's attention? And are you focusing enough on the first and second sentences and then the first sentence of the second paragraph? If this is somebody's news feed and there's 1,500 possible posts for them to see, this is basically what the news feed looks like. Here's somebody's story, here's somebody's story. Why would we not make our image, our thumbnail, brighter? Facebook's framework is blue. Why would we not make our image orange? It's a simple way of standing out. It's a simple way of going that extra 1%. Why would we not make our Twitter icon? Why would we use a logo for a Twitter icon with a white background that's transparent? Why would we not make it bright? Why would we not give it a deeper background? Why would we not make it catch people's attention? Why would we not make it bigger? If you're posting a blog on Facebook, so often we think about the quality of the blog, but we forget that Facebook's optimal image thumbnail for a, a Facebook link is 1,200 by 628. You can take up the exact most space by using that level of image. And everybody knows that the more people see it, the more people click, the more people um, have it shared in their own news feeds, and the more it will grow. Why not make it move? Facebook video is the most popular thing a content marketer can do right now. Facebook says, I want to compete with television. I want to compete with other content marketers so they are promoting videos at a clip that we've never seen before. They want to say, they want to bury Twitter video. They want to bury gifts across the internet. They want to win and be the television stream of individual users across the country. If we think about the composition of a photo, uh, this is the vertical horizon singer and Freddie Prince Jr. Can anybody see the dot quickly? Well, you've already seen them. How about now if we use Tim Riggins and Justin Bieber? Got one, two. The simple eye line, because people are more likely, if you post their face, they're not going to look at your headline, they're going to look at people's faces. We've looked at heat maps, and most people, if they see a face in their photo, are going to stare right here and right here and forget about everything that you're trying to communicate. So if we're going to use models in our photo, if we're going to put them on our home page and we want them to click a button, and the button's right here, why not have them look at the button? It's just like you see so many Instagram photos in travel of a destination with this beautiful mountain landscape or this cool road or this restaurant. And like 90% of them, they just stand like this and look. And mostly, people will just look at that person's back, and they'll forget to look at what's important about the photo. But if I want you to look at this slide, I'm going to look at it as well and stand to the side. If you don't optimize and look at that 1%, this is basically what your awesome story, your emotive story, your valuable story will look like. So when we look at destinations, where can we find that 1%? And in fact, it's everywhere. If you get out your phone, and you look at Instagram, look at how you hold your phone. About 90% of you are probably right-handed, right-handed. You hold your phone with your right hand? Yeah. You scroll with your right thumb? Yeah. So you're blocking out, roughly, if you hold your phone up and you look at it, like, like Ben's doing here, scrolling with your right thumb, you're blocking out about 33% of the photo. So we don't want to put our models, the most intriguing, exciting part of the photo, in that part that's getting blocked out by your thumb. So we look at heat maps. Slightly, the, the subject of this photo, slightly to the left, definitely in the upper part of it. If you look at your audience, you can find the 1% there. We had a destination whose audience was probably a lot like yours on Facebook, in which they were 28 to 34 year old, predominantly women that were following. We also looked at some advertising for them, and we were able to get their demographic, and most of them we found out actually had children. So we looked at dopamine levels of children and when they spike, and we started posting and making most of our posts within the 30-minute window where those dopamine levels are starting to bump up 
in which that person would actually have time to engage with the content. It's simple things like instead of extracting a photo off of Statagram where you find it and you ask permission, you get that permission and you take the photo from Statagram and you drag it to your desktop, it's actually going to the Instagram photo and I can show you how to do this afterwards. Finding the source code, getting to the source code, finding that image through the source code, downloading it to your desktop and you get a higher resolution, you get a bigger picture, it'll look better on your website, it'll expand bigger when you post it on Facebook. When you put it in your blog, it'll have a tighter resolution. For video, where is that 1% in video? And again, these are just examples. They can be found everywhere in which you work. And the more you do them, the more separation you're going to see from your competition. And your competition is everywhere. It's the news feed. It's the story that William creates about traveling to Arizona. It's the story about the US soccer team because you follow them on your page. It's the story about somebody's baby announcement. You are competing for the same space, but you are a destination marketer, you're a content marketer, and you're a skilled one, and you're going the extra 1% to make sure that you're in that space and you're grabbing the attention. So for video, we looked at Facebook's algorithm. And when Facebook first said, we're going to make video very popular, we looked at why they would spread video into people's newsfeed. What was their determining factor for what made video viral. And it also actually ended up corresponding with the average attention span of humans, which is seven seconds, which thanks to modern technology is now dipped below that of a goldfish. So if humans only pay attention for seven seconds, and Facebook's main factor in determining whether they want to share a video with more people because it's popular and it's relevant and engaging content is the simple idea of how much of the video do people watch, which was one of Facebook's main weights in that algorithm, we'd make it seven seconds. Because what happened is people would say, oh, this is a cool video. They'd watch it for a little longer. Their attention span would start to dive right around six, and then the video would be over, and Facebook, the lights would be going off. Relevant content. People are watching every single second of this video. So when we posted this video, it was instantly the most popular video the most popular post ever posted on Visit Wit Sundays, which is a beautiful, de beautiful destination in Queensland. It can be, the 1% can be in wording. The caption is so important. The title of your blog is so important. What is the most persuasive word in the English language? You. And this goes to the connection part of creating quality stories. When we connect with people, it's because we are connecting with them as individuals, and we are speaking to you with our posts. So with Japan, we put you in almost every single caption that we wrote. This can apply to tweets, blogs, print materials, websites. You are talking to individuals. Back to the idea of Tim Riggins and Justin Bieber showing you where the dot is in that puzzle. Heat maps. So instead of having somebody stare right at the destination, we don't want to focus on the person, because to most people on the Instagram page or to Facebook page of Travel Alberta, that looks like a stranger. It could be them. They would like that to be them. But right now, it's a stranger. We don't want them necessarily eyeing the stranger. We want them to eye the destination, the view that they could have at the top of this hike. So the 1% can be found in everywhere. And we're entering an age in content marketing where the 1% and the marginal gains that we can make are what make the separation, and never has it been more important. Almost every single social media profile or social media platform right now is going to an algorithm. Twitter has thought about it. Instagram has said, like, we're doing it, and then they got scared, and they're going to do it again. Pinterest has thought about it. Facebook, obviously, has done it for a long time. And whenever this happens, when a platform announces, we're going to an algorithm, everyone freaks out. And they say, oh no, our posts are going to get buried. Uh, I love, where's the headline where it was like, the world is over, basically? The algorithm apocalypse is coming on Instagram. And as a content marketer, you should say like, yes, we get an algorithm. Like, I am a skilled content marketer. I know what makes people click. I know what makes people engage. This is my opportunity to jump ahead of the competition. And what's great about the travel industry is that people want our content. People like our content. Our content 
gives them the feels, the emotions. It grabs their attention. It gives them value. It makes their life better. People who travel more are happier. People who travel more live longer. There is value in everything we do in travel. And now because of an algorithm, we have the opportunity to, uh, to showcase it more. So when we look at Instagram, opportunities are everywhere. And they're bigger than 1%. In some cases, and this gets a little cut off, the color matters 24% in terms of engagement. Whether you have a background or not, 29% in engagement. So the 1% can turn into 20%. And when Instagram goes into algorithm mode, every destination should benefit. Little tip, just from somebody who's run a lot of Instagram accounts, any guesses what the most popular photo was? This is Arizona's Instagram. It's the bottom right. Uh, water. I don't know whether it's like a survival instinct, but if you look back, I mean, I've even looked at like destinations that are in the desert, kind of like Arizona, and almost always their most popular images are that of water. Um, so go back and look at your own Instagram feed and just see for your destination if one of your top five most popular posts involves water in it. Maybe that's value that we're giving people the opportunity to survive in our destination. So we add all these up, we get the big difference. When we're fighting in the algorithm and we're competing in the news feed, the one percents that we do make all of the difference. If you don't optimize, you can write the best stories, but they're going right into one of these dots and they can get totally buried. So when we look back at content around the world and we step away from our travel bubble and we look for inspiration, do we have to look much farther than a typical flower. If your destination can be compared to almost anything in nature, it's that of a flower which has to attract visitors. It has to attract tourists so that it can spread. It is the bee that makes the flower grow. It's a pollinator. So what do flowers do for millions and millions of years before Facebook was invented is they get brighter. They change their landing destinations so that bees will be more attracted, so that heavier insects will be more attracted. They change the taste of their nectar based on the insect that is most likely to pass their pollen. The color. Flowers have electric fields that apparently insects can sense. Butterflies are more attracted to red. Bees are more attracted to blue. It is flowers that are some of the best content marketers in the world, and they follow the same rules that we do. It's that evolution, it's that 1%, it's that little change from generation to generation, from post to post, that make the difference in content marketing. It makes the difference in your social media accounts, in your blogs, in your Instagram posts. In theory, this is my last slide, content marketing to me is digital Darwinism. The destinations that evolve their content and optimize their content the best are the ones that will rise to the top in content marketing. And the ones that do it get the tourists to finally book a trip, just like the Bowerbirds. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Any questions? Yeah.